Hello everyone, uh, myself Anupam Kamerika, working as assistant professor under the department of child health nursing in Diva Patel College of Nursing. Uh, today we will be learning about acute rheumatic fever. Basically, acute rheumatic fever is, is nothing but it's an inflammatory disease which, which is caused by a bacteria called group A beta hemolytic streptococci and mainly affecting the uh, joints, heart, uh, skin, and the brains. Okay. And uh, uh, it is because of the uh, streptococci infection to the strep throat or the scarlet fever. It, can, it, is, uh, it typically develops two to four weeks after the streptococcal uh, infection or after the uh, throat infection. And uh, the symptoms which include here, that is like fewer, multiple painful joints, involuntary muscles movement, and uh, the uncommon non-itchy rashes, which is known as erythema margination. Okay, so these are like uh, the common symptoms which uh, comes under the rheumatic fever. We will be learning uh, about this in detail. Okay, so before going to the in detailed things, we will just have a look on the definition like what rheumatic fever is. Okay, rheumatic fever is, is nothing but it's an acute autoimmune collagen disease occurs as a hypersensitivity reaction to group A beta hemolytic streptococci infection. Okay, and it is characterized by inflammatory lesions of connective tissue and the endothelial tissue. So basically it affects the connective tissue and the endothelial tissues in a body. Okay, and now we know uh, the connective tissues and the endothelial tissues are more in uh, joints as well as in the heart, skin and the brain. Okay, so bas basically it is affecting the these areas where there is the connective tissues and the endothelial tissues are present. Okay, now what like autoimmune collagen. Okay, so like it is autoimmune that means like it our own uh, systems or our own antibodies will be affecting our own cells. Okay, and it is collagen disease. Okay, collagen is nothing but it is a structural protein uh, which is found in the skin uh, as well as in the connective tissue. Okay, so basically it is affecting because of the hypersensitivity reaction of group A beta hemolytic streptococci. Okay, our own immunity will be affecting our own connective tissues. Okay, so that is what uh, uh, happened here into the acute rheumatic fever. <coughs> So basically what happens here, uh, it will be affecting as I told you uh, to the connective tissues, basically the connective tissue will be in the heart and uh, the heart is involved in about half of the cases. <coughs> the permanent damage to the heart walls which is known as rheumatic heart disease. Okay, so basically uh, the, the acute rheumatic fever will be leading to the rheumatic heart diseases okay, which is usually only occurs after the multiple attacks of rheumatic fever. Uh, and occasionally it can occur after a single case of ARF also. Okay, and the damaged wall may result into the heart failure. Okay, and the abnormal wall also increases the risk for the person developing atrial fibrillation as well as the infection of the walls. Okay, so basically it affects the heart mainly, and yes, definitely the connectivations of other uh, areas also it will be affecting. Now we'll see like what is the incidence of it. Okay, so when you see the incidence, so it is most common or most important acquired heart diseases in the children. Okay, when it comes to the children, it is most acquired heart diseases. Okay, and acute rheumatic fever, it occurs about 325,000 children each year. Okay, so the, even in one year, it will be like 325,000 children will be affecting with the rheumatic fever. Okay, and about 80 million. 80 million people currently have the rheumatic heart disease because of the ARF. Okay, because of the ARF, they will be having the rheumatic heart disease. Now, 80 uh, million people, okay, and those who get ARF, okay, are most often between the age of 5 to 14 years. Okay, so basically, 5 to 14 years of age children will be affecting more with the uh, infections called rheumatic fever. Okay, and with 20% of the first time attacks will be occurring uh, during the adults. Most of the deaths, okay, yes definitely, it will be leading to the uh, deaths also. And most of the deaths occurs in the developing world, okay, and that will be like 12.5% of people affecting, uh, affected, they are dying each year. So those who affect with the uh, ARF, 12.5 people will be dying. Okay, and 
It is very much common in developing countries. So as responsibilities which is acted dramatically over is very much common in the developing countries because uh, substandard health practices because the developing countries are having the substandard practices or over exuberant uh, living conditions okay, and the poor economical status. So, so these are the reasons why it is more common in the developing countries. Okay, so this is what uh, about the incidences. I will see uh, like what causes uh, rheumatic fever. Okay, so there are certain etiology and there are certain uh, what you can say the risk factors we have here. Okay, now when you see the etiology, basically the etiology is unknown, but with the recent studies that showed that group A beta hemolytic streptococci are the precipitating factor or which will be causing the infection and through which uh, uh, it will be affecting the hearts and connective tissues. Okay. So now recent studies also shown that along with the group A, there are group E and group G. Okay, uh, so group A, group E and group G, beta hemolytic streptococci, those are also causing the infection uh, to the patient and they will be having the rheumatic fever. Okay, so along with this etiology, there are certain risk factors, there are certain precipitating factors we have, uh, those who are contributing to have the uh, infections. Those are sore throats, okay, like sore throat infection due to the uh, streptococci or the pharyngitis, if there is inflammation to the pharynx. Okay, so definitely that will lead to the <coughs> streptococcal infection and which will be affecting the connective tissue. Along with that, the person with the genetic problems, okay, if the person have a genetic problem, so those, are, those, those, children, those children or those persons are more prone to get an infection called rheumatic fever. Even the malnutrition and the poverty, okay, these are also a, uh, contributing factors, what we can say. These are also helping uh, for the rheumatic fever to occur and definitely the poor hygiene as well as the poor sanitation. Okay, poor hygiene definitely and the sanitation, these are also contributing towards the rheumatic fever. So these are like etiology as well as the risk factors uh, for the acute rheumatic fever. Now when we see the pathophysiology, as I told you, <coughs> it affects mainly the four areas. Okay, those are like heart, joints and uh, uh, brain as well as the skin. Okay, so what happens here when it happens? Okay, so that is what the, uh, what you can say the Okay, that is what we can say uh, the pathophysiology. Okay, basically there will be a septococcal infection. Okay, there will be septococcal entry of organism into the body. Okay, through which uh, there will be infection to the throat and there will be streptococcal infection to the throat, there will be sore throat and all. And from there, uh, what you can say, the, the uh, organism or the pathogen will travel. Okay. So when it is a streptococcal infection, when we uh, have antibiotic therapy uh, with the streptococcal infection, definitely the problem will be solved. Okay. Uh, if it is not happening, okay, if we are not uh, detecting the early streptococcal infection, so what happens? So definitely the, the further uh, patho pathology will be there. Okay, so that is what, uh, what we can say. There will be done, uh, the entry of this organism into the body, okay, which is like group A beta hemolytic streptococci and which will lead to the autoimmune response. Okay, that means that antigen antibody reactions will be taking place and there will be uh, acute systematic inflammatory disorder. Okay, so there will be acute systematic inflammatory disorder. And there will be a formation of the antibodies which are harming the connective tissues. They will be forming the antibodies which are like harming the uh, our own connective tissues. That is that is what we call autoimmunity or autoimmune disorder. Okay. So this anti, uh, what you can say, the auto antibodies will attack the four areas as I told you, heart, joints, as well as skin and the brain. Okay. So we'll just see what happens in the joints. Okay, so basically here, when it affects the connective tissues of the joints, okay, so there will be inflammation to the synovial membrane, there will be inflammation to the synovial membrane as well as <coughs> uh, synovial membrane of the knees, ankle, wrist and the elbows. Okay, so basically what happens when there is an uh, uh, attack of the antibodies, like atom antibodies to the connective tissues of the joint. Okay, so basically there are the major joints, 
uh, in a body like knees, ankle, wrist, and the elbows. These are affected, and there will be inflammation to the synovial membrane of this uh, joints. Okay, and that will be leading to the edema and the effusion, as well as there will be a joint pain. Okay, that changes will be seen into the joints. Okay, now what happens in the heart? Okay, when it, it, it comes to the heart, okay, when there is uh, atom immunity or atom antibodies will attack the uh, connective tissues of the heart. Okay, so what happens there? Okay, there will be inflammatory hemorrhagic bullous lesions in uh, formation of the inflammation or there will be formation of the hemorrhagic bullous region in uh, layers of the heart. Okay, there are, as you know, there are three layers we have. Okay, so in any layer of the heart, there will be formation of the bullous lesions. Okay, these lesions we call Ashtoff nodules. Okay, this, this uh, lesions we call Ashtoff nodules. These are the small nodules which is composed of cells and the leukocytes. Okay, so these formations will be there and that will lead to Okay, that will lead to the fibrous and the serofibrous exudate. Okay, they'll be leading to the fibrous and the serofibrous exudate. Okay, there will be formation of the exudate and the, the layers of the heart will be involved. Okay, and they'll be affecting the layers of the heart so that uh, the, the, the normal functioning of the heart will be compromised. Okay, so there will be involvement of the endocardium as well as the wall. Okay, so endocardium definitely is the innermost layer of the heart and the which is again attached to the walls and all and uh, there will be involvement of this area as well as what happens with this involvement there will be uh, a compromisation of the uh, functioning of the wall okay. and there will be formation of the vegetative lesions on the wall reflex okay there will be formation of the reflex wall, wall reflex will be having the uh, vegetative lesions okay and the fibrous scar uh, uh, then there the fibrous scar tissues of the wall and uh, because of this scar and all uh, there will be contraction and dysfunction in the wall leaflets. As we know walls, uh, the, the main function of the wall to open and close and through which the blood supplies uh, will be there. Okay, So when this functioning will disappear or when this functioning will be not there definitely the blood flow will be compromised. Okay, So what happens with that there will be shortening of the quadrant engine. Okay, so now, now quadrant tendon is what we see here. The quadrant tendon is that you, you can see here in the diagram, like quadrant tendon is. Okay, these are the heart strings, or it is also called like cord uh, like tendons. Okay, these are present in the heart, in the layers of the heart endocardium, which will be uh, attached to the walls. Okay, and that will be helping the walls uh, to close and open. Okay, so when there is a shortening of the quadrant tendon, okay, that will. Uh, uh, help or that will uh, that will lead to the uh, dysfunctioning of the wall so wall will not able to close properly and because of that there will be again valvular defects will be seen so that is what called it like chronic valvular defects of the heart that will be seen <coughs> with the shortening of the cardiac engine okay and that is what will be leading to the RHC. okay so that is like rheumatic heart diseases okay where, where, are, where, where, where there are uh, many uh, what you can say the valvular defects are there like mitral regurgitation stenosis and all aortic stenosis and all so that will be seen here after this uh, uh, condition like uh, the living valvular defects in the heart so that is what happened here into the heart when it affects the connective tissues of the heart so next we'll see like as I told you, it affects along with the heart, it affects the skin also. Okay, when, so when it affects the skin, okay, so there will be antibodies which are affecting the connective tissues of the skin. Okay, so when it affects to the skin, basically what happens, there will be macular rashes will be seen on the trunk as well as on the extremities. Okay, there will be macular rashes on the trunk as well as on the extremities will be seen. Definitely simultaneously affect the connective tissue of the brain also. Okay, and when it affects to the connective tissues of the brain, there will be chorea. Okay, so that will be leading to the chorea. Chorea is nothing but it's a involuntary movements of the extremities. Okay, so that will be seen <coughs> after the affection of the uh, to the connective tissues of the brain. So this is what what all about the uh, pathophysiology of uh, acute rheumatic fever. Okay, so there are I have uh, certain pictures of it. So I'll just uh, show you. These are like uh, Ashcock nodules. Okay, as I told you, uh, these are like Oshkov nodules which are there and that will be formation of Oshkov nodules. These are uh, called like small nodules which are uh, com uh, composed of cells, leukocytes which are found in the tissues of the heart. Okay, 
then you have here the body tendon okay so these are the body tendon like heart strings what you can say which are uh, connected to the walls which are helping the uh, walls to uh, function properly and uh, yes so as i told you they will be leading to the fusion of the leaflets so here the leaf is like fused okay so that will be not enable to open properly and that will be having the dysfunctioning of the leaflets then you can see here the macular rashes as i told you when it affects to the skin okay the rashes will be seen on the skin okay and uh, that will be uh, specifically on the trunk as well as on the extremities so these are like <coughs> in the pathophysiology what we can say next we will see uh, like uh, clinical features what will be the clinical features of uh, uh, acute rheumatic fever so basically the clinical feature is grouped as major minor and essential manifestations okay which is described by modified jones criteria okay so basically the jones criteria are used here uh, to describe the manifestations and which is grouped under the major manifestations minor manifestations and the essential manifestations okay so we'll see one by one like what includes in the major manifestations so the first what we have here the major manifestations okay so under the major manifestations uh, the first symptom or the first thing what we can see here that is the carditis okay so carditis as you know there will be inflammation of the layers of the heart okay so there will be <coughs> there might be pericarditis there might be endocarditis or the myocarditis okay so so there will be carditis okay and that will be accompanied with or that will be characterized by all these uh, uh, changes okay so that is like presence of significant murmur there will be presence of significant murmur along with the carditis there will be ecg changes as usually there will be a uh, prolonged yaan interval PR interval, there will be cardiac enlargement. Okay, so cardiac megaly can be seen, as well as the friction drug. Okay, friction drug will be there. Pericardial effusion. Okay, that is also will be there. And the features of the heart failure. Okay, so the features of heart failure also will be seen, and that occurs around about 50 to 60 percent of patients. Okay, so 50 to 60 percent of patients will be having the features of uh, cardiac uh, failure. Okay, or the heart failure. What you say? So this is the first symptom. what you can say under the major manifestation that is carditis which is along uh, accompanied with all these things all these symptoms next we have polyarthritis okay the next uh, major manifestation is polyarthritis okay as you know polyarthritis there will be inflammation of the joints okay as it is poly there will be inflammation of the many joints okay so basically it affects the knees ankle and the elbow okay these are the major joints in the body knees ankle and the elbow these are uh, affected by the uh, uh, what do you say at affected by the uh, streptococcus okay and there will be a flittering or migrating type of inflammation uh, which will be seen into the joints like ankle knees and elbows there will be joint pain there will be compromised active movements okay there will be decreased movement active movements uh, in the joints what you can say then the tenderness also will be there redness even the swelling Okay, over the uh, joints or over the joints, we can see all these things, uh, which is comes under the like polyarthritis, which is included under the accompanied with the polyarthritis. So that is what the second manifestation what we have here under the major criteria or major manifestation. <coughs> so here uh, the, fifth, the diagram and the fifth diagram, uh, things are given like uh, these all joints will be involved. Okay, even the ankles, the elbows. Wrist as well as the knees and all will be uh, compromised here, and that will be affected here with the streptococcal infection, which leading to the polyarthritis. Okay. Now the third thing or the third symptom or third manifestation, what comes under the major manifestation is chorea. Okay. So as I told you, chorea is purposeless, involuntary, rapid jerky movements. Okay. It is purposeful, uh, involuntary, rapid jerky movements. Okay. So which will be resulting. in decreased speech okay will be decreased uh, there will be speech disturbance as i told you there will be speech disturbance as well as, uh, as well as there will be muscle weakness okay muscle weakness will be seen accompanied with the chorea 
muscular in coordination there will be no coordination with the muscles there will be awkward gait okay so definitely the position of the child will be changed okay awkward gait will be there as well as involuntary facial grimaces okay so these are like again uh, accompanied symptoms along with the chorea okay so chorea as i told you is involuntary rapid jerky movements which is accompanied with the weakness muscle weakness coordination in coordination awkward gait involuntary facial grimaces as well as the speech disturbances <coughs> Okay, so this is the fourth uh, major manifestation. Okay, fourth man manifestation is subcutaneous nodules. Okay, there will be formation of the subcutaneous nodules. Okay, so uh, nodules, uh, subcutaneous nodules is nothing but uh, these are the collection of the collagen fibers over the bony prominences. So over the bony prominences, here you can see in the picture. So these are like called uh, nodules. Okay, these are called uh, subcutaneous nodules. So these are the collection of collagen fiber over the bony prominences. Okay, these are uh, painless nodules over the extensor surface on the certain joints. As I told you, joints which includes knee, elbow, okay, and elbow and ankle. Okay, so these are like the joints which are uh, affected here, as well as it will be there on the occiput as well as the vertebral column also. Okay, so these. Painless nodules will be there on the occiput and the vertebral columns also. Columns also. So this is the fourth uh, major manifestation uh, which comes under the Jones criteria. Okay. The next what we have that is erythema marginatum. Okay. Erythema marginatum. These are like skin infections or we can see it is a pink macular uh, non-itchy rashes. Okay. These are pink macular non-itchy rashes. Okay. Basically found over the trunk and the uh, extremity. So here we can see these are the rashes over the trunk and this, this is the extremity, lower extremity. So here you can see the pink macular rashes. Okay. So these are like uh, seen uh, but this rashes will not be there on the face. Okay. It will never, never be on the face. Okay. And uh, it is like extremely rare in the Indians. Okay. So it is mostly seen in the western countries. This uh, symptom will be seen in the but and but it is rarely in the in Indian peoples. So which again comes under the major manifestation, which is the fifth one. The next is Canicum's murmur. Okay, the next is Canicum's murmur. Okay, so this is nothing but a delayed diastolic micro murmur. Okay, it is detail, uh, delayed diastolic mitral murmur. Okay, that is heard during the course of the ARF. Okay, so Canicum's murmur, uh, this is also a diastolic mitral murmur which will be uh, heard during the course of ARF. So this also comes under the major manifestation or the major criteria. So these are the six symptoms which comes under the uh, major manifestations or the major criteria. Now the next week we can see here the minor manifestations. Okay, the minor manifestations again uh, involved, or it is also called like minor criteria. These are involved again six more symptoms. Okay, Th those are like low grade fever. Okay, there will be low grade fever, uh, which is which is rarely goes above thirty nine point five degree Celsius. Okay, so it is rarely goes above that. Okay, so it will be between the one not one degree Fahrenheit to one not four degree Fahrenheit, so it is like low grade fever and that is highest in the afternoon. Okay, then next next you have the arthralgia. Okay, there will be arthralgia. Okay, there will be uh, joint pains. Okay, pain in the joints that occurs about ninety percent of patients. Okay, it will be having like ninety percent of patients will be having the arthralgia. Okay, the next is like previous attack of rheumatic fever. Okay. So this is also considered under the mani minor manifestations, okay, and it will be applicable for the second attack of it. Okay, those who have the repeated uh, rheumatic fever or those who have the repeated uh, attack of rheumatic fever, okay, that will be considered here as a previous one and which will be considered under the minor manifestations. Okay, the fourth one is ECG changes. Okay, there will be ECG changes will be seen. Uh, basically, there will be a prolonged uh, PR interval. Okay, prolonged PR interval will be seen. 
then the, there will be elevated ESR. Okay, so ESR basically it will be elevated more than 30 mm of uh, mm per hour. Okay, so that will be more than that. So uh, there will be elevated ESR as well as there will be presence of C reactive protein. Okay, so presence of C reactive protein, protein also will be there, which is like more than 3 mg per dl. Okay, 3 mg per dl. So these are like uh, few manifestations which comes under the minor one or minor criteria. Okay. Then the third is uh, main thing like uh, essential manifestations. Okay, so after the major and minor, we have the essential manifestations, very which includes like two things. One is elevated anti-steptolysin O titer. Okay, elevated anti-steptolysin O titer. That indicates the previous infection. Okay, that indicates the previous infection of streptococci, which comes under the essential manifestation. And the anti-septolysing O titer, the normal range of it is 200 international units per ml. Okay, if it is more than that, that will be called elevation. Okay, that will be called elevation. The next, uh, the second is essential manifestation, what we have that is throat swab positive for the culture. Okay, streptococci culture. Okay, so there will be positive throat swab culture. Okay, so this is again com comes under or considered under the essential manifestations. Okay, so this is uh, uh, all about like manifestations. Along with these three categories, there are more, one more category we have, like other manifestations, which includes, which includes uh, like multiple painful joints. Okay, as I, as I told you, arthralgia will be there. There will be uh, pain, painful joints will be there. There will be involuntary uh, muscle movements. Okay, there will be involuntary muscle movement. There will be chest pain. Okay, there will be palpitation. Okay, heart palpitation also will be seen as well as uh, breathlessness will be there on the excision. Okay, there will be excisional or activity associated breathlessness. Even the breathing problems will be there when the patient is lying down. Okay, and uh, the swelling, uh, there will be fainting. Okay, so these are again uh, things are there. Then generalized weakness, there will be malaise. There will be generalized weakness, you can see there will be easy fatigability. Okay, the children will be like uh, feeling fatigue. Okay, there will be tachycardia. Okay, increased heart rate will be seen, malaise will be seen, abdominal pain also will be there. There will be erythema nodosum. Okay, there will be erythema nodosum. These are again nodules which are which are uh, under the skin. Okay, and this will be like pain. This will be like painful nodules. Okay, these are like erythema nodus nodosum, uh, which are which are seen under the skin. There will be nodules under the skin and which are painful. Uh, Nodules. Okay, then anemia also will be seen, pleuritis, okay, and weight loss. Okay, so these are again a manifestation categorized under the other manifestations. So this is all about the Jones criteria. What, uh, what uh, accordingly, uh, character, uh, what do you say? The categories are made accordingly. Okay. So now how we can diagnose with this Jones criteria? Okay. So as we have seen, the Jones criteria of the, all the manifestations or the class symptoms are categorized under the major manifestation, minor manifestation, essential manifestation, and there are some un, uh, under the other manifestations, okay. So when you see this uh, symptoms, when you see these manifestations, okay, so we, there is a presence of two major criteria. If there is a presence of two major criteria, okay, that will be considered, uh, the patient will be considered of having a rheumatic fever. If the patient is showing two symptoms, under the major criteria, okay. Or if the person is having one major criteria and two minor criteria, okay. If the patient is having one major manifestation and two minor manifestations, then that person is also indicating a rheumatic fever, or that person is also indicating the rheumatic infection. So this is how uh, we can diagnose the patient according to the modified Jones criteria. Along with this, you have again uh, various diagnostic uh, modalities, okay, like history collection, where the, the, the history collection uh, uh, will be based on 
like uh, what what the patient how uh, he has got the infection from where the genetic background of the patient okay so with this you can just identify whether the patient is uh, what cause is like why the patient is having rheumatic fever even the uh, physical examination on the physical examination yes the murmur sound will be uh, auscultated okay so you will have the murmur sound there then yes throat culture you can just have a throat culture so that will be again positive for the swab Okay, then uh, the blood test uh, also can be done okay, to check for the strep throat and the sign of uh, recent strep infection. Okay, so streptococcal infection. For that reason, again, blood test can be done. Okay, then you can have the Doppler echocardiography. Okay, Doppler echocardiography also can be done. Then you can go for the uh, electrocardiogram or the MRI of the heart. Okay, so with this again, you can just diagnose the case. Then the artificial subcutaneous nodule. A taste okay, that also can be done okay and along with this uh, there is one more thing like endomyocardial biopsy okay endomyocardial biopsy I, I think uh, it is not there okay so endocardi endocardi endomyocardial biopsy okay that also can be done here endo I'll just write here biopsy okay that is also one of the diagnostic evaluations here which 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 are showing the ashcroft nodules or the histocyte which which can confirm the diagnosis okay for that reason again in the myocardial biopsy can be uh, sent okay so these are like diagnostic evaluations which through which we can just diagnose the patient uh, for the acute rheumatic fever okay next we'll see The management okay now what will be the management here how we can just manage this case how we can just have uh, uh, the um, what can they how, how we can just have the proper management to uh, treat the patient with the rheumatic fever okay so so our management should be based on all uh, these three aims okay the first aim what you have that is the suppression of the acute inflammatory process okay so we have to act on the Separation of the inflammatory process. How we can just suppress the inflammatory process? How we can just reduce the inflammatory process? That is what we have to see. Then we have to eradicate the streptococcal infection. Okay, so we have to just eradicate the streptococcal infection. And the third is prevention of reoccurrence. Okay, so we have to focus on the prevention also so that there will be no reoccurrence of the disease also. Okay, so these are the three aims on which our uh, manage or treatment modalities are based on. Okay, so we'll see one by one what, what it includes. Okay, the first thing is like bed rest. Okay, so it is most important thing. Okay, the bed rest is important in the management of the children with rheumatic fever. Okay, so uh, it is needed for at least six to eight hours. Okay, it is needed for six to eight hours till the rheumatic activities are disappearing. Okay, so daily six to eight hours till the rheumatic activities are disappearing. The bed rest is important one. The next, what you have, that is the nutritious diet. Okay, so the patient should have a nutritious diet. Okay, that uh, will be provided, uh, which includes the sufficient amount of protein, vitamins, and the micronutrients. Okay, there will be sufficient amount of proteins as well as the vitamins and the micronutrients in a diet. So, so the patient should have the nutritious diet. Okay, so there will be salt restriction unless the CSF, CCF is recommended or CCF is seen. Okay, so salt restriction is not necessary until the CCF is present. Okay, the next you have, you have to avoid the rich spicy food. Okay, so these are like nutritional diet. Uh, the patient should have, there will be no salt restriction unless there will be CCF and should avoid the spicy uh, foods. Next you have like antibiotic therapy. Now what antibiotic therapy can have here for the rheumatic fever? Okay, so the first thing is like drug of choice is penicillin. Okay, so drug of choice is penicillin here. So this is like uh, a drug, antibiotic drug can be given. Okay, and the initial dose is proclam penicillin, proclam penicillin, four lakh units deep in the IM, twice a day for 10 to 14 days. Okay. So proclam penicillin can be given 4 lakh unit deep in IM twice a day for 10 to 14 days. Okay, so this is the initial dose for the proclam penicillin. Once the baby is diagnosed with the rheumatic fever, you can go for the proclam penicillin, 4 lakh international units, 
deep I am twice a day for 10 to 14 days. Okay. Then a long acting benzathine penicillin also can be uh, given here. Benzathine penicillin, uh, which is 1.5 mega unit every 21 days. Or it can be given 0.6 mega units for every 15 days. Okay, so every 15 days. This is like long acting uh, benzathine penicillin. Okay, so this is the dose for the long acting benzathine penicillin is 1.2 mega unit for every 21 days and 0.6 mega units for every 15 days. Okay, next you have like oral penicillin also. Okay, you can go for the oral penicillin also and the dose for the oral penicillin is 4 lakh units. So that is 250 mg for every 4 to 6 hours for 10 to 14 days. Okay, so it can be given for the for the 10 to 15, 14 days. Okay, for every 4 to 6 hours and those recommended dose is 250 mg or 4 lakh units. Okay, so that is oral penicillin. And those the patient those who have uh, those who those those who have uh, penicillin sensitive sensitivity or what you can say the penicillin sensitivity uh, sensitive patients okay for them uh, we can go for the erythromycin we can go for the erythromycin and the dose is 1 mg sorry 1 gram daily for 10 days okay so the dose is 1 gram daily for 10 days okay along with the erythromycin you can go for the azithromycin also and the clarithromycin also okay which is recommended by the american heart association <coughs> and the dose for this uh, azithromycin and the clarithromycin is 15 mg per kg. Okay, the dose is 15 mg per kg in children. Okay, so this is the antibiotic therapy what we can uh, have here for the rheumatic fever. Next is like suppressive therapy. As I told you, we have to suppress the infection. Okay, so we, we can go for the suppressive therapy. Here in the suppressive, suppressive therapy, we have a true uh, treatment, two treatment modalities, like one is aspirin therapy and the steroid therapy. Okay, so like aspirin therapy, uh, the aspirin can be given here and the dose for the aspirin is 90 to 120 mg per kg per day and that can be given in four divided doses. Okay, and that may be needed for the 12 weeks. Okay, that may be needed for the 12 weeks. And it is given to control the pain and the inflammation. Okay, it's controlled to, uh, uh, to control the pain and the inflammation. Okay, and that should not be given empty stomach. Okay, should not give aspirin empty stomach. Okay, and that should be uh, antacid accompanied with the aspirin. Okay, so prior to the aspirin, we have to go for the antacid and then aspirin can be given and the recommended dose is 90 to 120 mg per kg per day in four divided doses. Okay, for the 12 weeks. Okay. Then the second uh, suppressive therapy what you have that is a steroid therapy. Okay. So steroids here included uh, which are uh, drug of choice what you can say here like prednisolone, dexamethasone and betamethasone. Okay. So these are like drugs which comes under the steroidal therapy. Okay. And for the prednisolone when you give for the prednisolone, okay, the dose recommended dose for the prednisolone is 40 to 60 mg per day. Okay, 40 to 60 mg per day or 2 mg per kg per day in 4 divided doses and that can be given for 7 to 10 days. That can be given for the 7 to 10 days. So after the 10 days you can just refer uh, this dose to the 1 mg per kg per day over the 12 weeks. Okay, so for the prednisolone you can start with the 40 to 60 mg per day or 2 mg per kg per day in 4 divided doses which is given for the 7 to 10 days. And then it is tapered to the 1 mg per kg per day over the 12 weeks. Okay. Then you have here again other corticosteroids like dexamethasone and the benzamethasone. Okay, that is the dose for these drugs are 2 to 5 mg per kg per day in divided doses. Okay, that can be given as anti-inflammatory agents. Okay, that can be given as an anti-inflammatory agent and the dose is, dose is 2 to 5 mg per kg per day in divided doses. Okay, so that is dexamethasone and benzamethasone. Okay, so these drugs are considered under the suppressive therapy. Okay, so this is again a one more treatment modality what we have for the rheumatic fever. <coughs> Next, 
uh, treatment modality, what we can say, we have to have here, we have to manage the chorea also, isn't it? So the management of chorea, yes, that is also most important thing here. We have to manage the chorea, and for that reason, we have the drugs like diazepam and the phenobarbital. Okay, so these are the drugs can be given in order to control the chorea, in order to control the involuntary movements of the extremities. Okay. Then you can have here, if there are the uh, treatment, uh, what is the treatment for the complications, okay, if, if, if the child is having the complications, okay, if the child is having the complication, if the, if the, if the complications are present, okay, then, uh, especially for the CCF and all, okay, so as I told you, it will be leading to the CCF, okay, so when there is a complications, uh, especially the CCF, the symptomatic treatment can be given, so you have to just look for the symptom and accordingly uh, start the treatment. Okay, accordingly, the symptomatic treatment, uh, yes, definitely has to be given properly. Okay, and at last, what you can say, a good nursing care uh, with emotional support to the child. Okay, so that is recommended. Okay, so we should have a good nursing care with the emotional support to the child and the parents. Okay, so this is like all about the management, what it includes in a rheumatic fever. Next is like uh, if the child has damaged heart wall, okay, if the child has damaged heart wall, okay, that is a narrow or leak in the blood to the stain, uh, their heart, uh, but they need the surgery or they need a repair or replace the wall, okay, for that reason, okay, sometimes a wall is too narrow, a balloon catheter procedure or it is also called balloon valloplasty, okay, that can be done here in order to open the wall without surgery. Okay, so we, we have a catheter which is guided with the, uh, the balloon which is guided with the catheter and the, that will be inserted in the valve and the valve will be opened with the help of the balloon. Okay, that is like procedure called balloon valvoplasty. Okay, that can be done here uh, in order to open the valve if it is involved. Okay, if the valve, heart valves are involved with the rheumatic fever. Okay, so that can be done here without the surgery. Okay. But sometimes what happens, in many cases, the walls cannot be opened with the balloon procedure. Okay, we cannot open with the balloon procedure, the walls cannot be opened. So here, when these conditions are there, then definitely the child requires a surgery. Okay, the child requires a surgery, which can, which, where we can just replace the wall with an artificial wall. Okay, so we can just replace the original wall uh, of the child, of the heart, okay, and uh, with the artificial uh, wall. Okay, so these are like treatment modalities what we can have here. Okay, now next is like preventive prophylactic therapy. Like what are the preventive prophylactic therapy has to be uh, carried out. Okay, so it is indicated after the rheumatic fever, okay, and acute rheumatic viruses to uh, prevent further damage to the wall. Okay, we have to just prevent and have the prophylactic therapy. And for that reason, these are the drugs what can be uh, given as a prophylactic therapy. So where the benzene penicillin G is given IM for every four weeks and the dose is 0 0.6 to 1.2 million unit okay, of benzene penicillin G uh, every four weeks are recommended regimen for the secondary prophylaxis okay, for the most of the patient. Okay. Although along with this or uh, it can uh, instead of this, you can just go for the uh, penicillin, oral, oral penicillin uh, prophylaxis that is also effective here. Okay. And the patient with rheumatic fever with carditis, if the patient shows the carditis and the wall diseases, okay, so that should receive antibiotic therapy at least for the 10 years. Okay, that they should receive the phototherapy or that they should receive the antibiotic therapy uh, at least for the 10 years or until the age of 40 years. Okay, so the continuously they should receive the antibiotic therapy in order to uh, prevent uh, the rheumatic fever. Okay, so this is like preventive prophylactic therapy. Next is like, uh, this is all about like medical management as well as the surgical uh, management, what you can say. Next we just move towards like nursing management. Like what will be the nursing management here or what will be the nursing diagnosis here. So I have the list of the nursing diagnosis, I'll just uh, see one by one. Um, the first is like decreased cardiac output. Yes, definitely with this condition we have the decreased cardiac output which is related to the disturbance in the closure of the mitral wall or the wall stenosis. Okay, the second is like ineffective peripheral tissue perfusion. 
uh, which is related to the decrease metabolic primarily due to the vasoconstriction of peripheral blood vessels. The third we have like acute pain related to the inflammation of the synovial uh, membrane. Okay, then the fourth we have like hyperthermia, which is related to the inflammation of the synovial membrane and the inflammation of the heart wall. Next we have like imbalanced nutrition less than the body requirement related to the increase in uh, stomach acid. Okay, so uh, these are like the next we have activity intolerance. Okay, so which is related to the muscle weakness, prolonged bed rest, or the immobilization. We can have, next we have like a self care deficit related to the musculoskeletal disorder, uh, polyarthritis, arthralgia, and the therapy uh, like uh, bed rest. Then uh, the next is like impaired skin integrity, uh, which is related to the inflammation of the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. Risk, uh, these are like potential uh, diagnosis. These are actual like diagnosis, these are comes under the potential diagnosis. Those are like risks for the impaired gas exchange related to the accumulation of the blood into the lung due to the increased arterial filling and the risk for the injury which are related to the involuntary movements. Okay. So these are like certain nursing diagnosis uh, through which we have to uh, take care of a child. Okay, and for that reason we uh, we can just improve the cardiac output uh, by taking prevention or the interventions like providing rest as long as the rheumatic activities and heart failure uh, persist and we can just have interrupted rest, uh, we can just have modify the activities of the child, okay, we can maintain the normal body temperature, okay, we can provide a, uh, a blind diet and adequate nutritional intake to the child, okay, we can administer the medications here, we can have the cardiac monitoring, we can have a monitoring, monitor on cardiac functioning, okay, so in order to improve the cardiac output, we can just uh, take these measures. Okay, then for the relieving of the pain, as I as I've seen the second uh, nursing diagnosis for relieving of the pain, we can just have here like uh, we have to have we have to provide a, a comfortable position to the child. Okay, and we have to inflame the support uh, joints. Okay, we have to just uh, support the inflamed joints. Okay, and we can just administer the antibiotic, uh, anti-inflammatory analgesics. Okay, we can arrange the diversional activities for the children so that they can just uh, relieve the pain. Okay, then we can just protect the child from the injuries. Okay, so as we have seen here, the risk, they will be having the risk for the uh, injuries in order to have the involuntary movements and all. So we can just remove the hard and sharp objects from the child's reach and assist the child for the uh, in every activity so that they'll be, uh, we can just reduce the injury of the child. Okay, so this is all about like nursing diagnosis, what we can, uh, have here and the nursing interventions what we can take for uh, in order to uh, take care of a child properly. Now next you can see here the complications. Okay, the, when we are when we are not treating properly a rheumatic fever, these these are the complications can be seen like rheumatic heart diseases where there will be a valvular defects we will be seen and the heart failure. CCF, ineffective endocarditis, even the pericardial effusion, permanent cardiac damage. Okay, these are the complications can be seen with the acute rheumatic fever. So this is all about the rheumatic fever which we have seen. Uh, so I just uh, conclude my topic like uh, what we have seen uh, starting from the acute rheumatic fever. We have seen the why it is there, like what uh, what are the definitions of uh, acute rheumatic fever, how it causes. Okay, there are group A, beta hemolytic streptococci, which are again having the active immunity and which affects the connective tissues of the heart, basically the uh, heart, joints, skin, okay, and the brain. Okay, and then what are the pathologies there? What uh, the pathophysiology will be seen there when it affects the connective tissues there? Then the clinical manifestations we have seen, which is divided into the four categories. One is uh, major manifestation, minor manifestations, and uh, essential manifestation, and other. Uh, manifestations and then we have seen the Jones criteria as well as we have seen the management how we can just treat a baby there are like uh, three uh, what you can say the three things what we have to check like we have to have the aim in order to uh, manage the case like suppression of acute inflammatory process eradication of septococcal infection and the prevention of reoccurrence of the disease and uh, we have seen the nursing management also what are the majors or what are the interventions can be taken in order to improve the cardiac output in order to relieve the pain in order to protect the child from the injury. Okay, so this is all about the rheumatic fever. Any questions?